Welcome everyone to this month's Quantum Marketplace. I'm Celia Mertzbacher. I'm Executive Director of the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, or QEDC. Um, we're really excited about the program we have today on quantum networking test beds. Um, so I won't take much time, but I do want to let uh, those of you who are members know that QEDC is going to have uh, its member plenary meeting at the end of March in Chattanooga. You'll be hearing more about what's going on there. We're very excited to um, be hosted by Chattanooga for that meeting and hope that those of you who are members or maybe are interested in becoming a member and interested in this topic will reach out to us. So um, welcome. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Whippich to get us going today. Great, thank you, Celia. So this webinar event is going to be on quantum networking test beds, a very hot topic. So first I'll talk about the quantum marketplace, uh, then I'll give a quick uh, overview and trends update uh, in, in quantum networking test beds, and then also uh, we'll get into the lineup and have them all present, and then we'll have a roundtable discussion and then a few comments on upcoming events. So the quantum marketplace, what is it? it? It raises brand awareness, it facilitates collaboration, deals, and partnerships. And this has been consistent since we've launched this over two years ago. So we have two aspects of the quantum marketplace. One is a web directory. This is publicly facing uh, on the QDC website. Uh, it lists the companies, what they do, what they provide in the ecosystem. And if they have a little pink icon next to their name, that means they've already presented in the quantum marketplace. And you can go find those videos on YouTube. And to find that, just type in YouTube slash quantum marketplace or type in quantum marketplace in Google and it will populate the first page and take you there. Okay, so some overview and trends uh, in the space. And just before anybody asks, uh, this, this is going to be recorded. It is being recorded. It will be on YouTube probably later in March. Uh, and today we you're gonna have Cubitech, which is powering the EPB quantum network. Uh, we're gonna have NIST, Keysight, Quanopticon, Alero, and IonQ. So how do we make quantum networks work? I thought it would be good to overview sort of a process look at this, uh, process cycle look. So first, you know, we're gonna start with a quantum network. Okay, so what do we need to do to do this? Well, the first thing is we need universities actually to do research, but then taking that research, we need commercial companies providing quantum systems and components uh, to work in the network. And we're gonna need quantum network test beds so we can test this out. Uh, and to do that, we need to have purpose-built metrology, which we don't really have yet, uh, but it's happening, it's starting to happen. And we need to develop standards, and we need to probably go through this cycle many times, but we need all of these blocks are very important. This is by mo no means an exhaustive list, but this, this is definitely four areas that are needed uh, to be worked on to build quantum networks. Okay, so two types of networks. There's more than these two types of networks, but I thought it would be good to have an illustration of you know, many times we talk about a local area quantum networks uh, and we talk about other types. But so what do we need in a local area quantum network? We need quantum memory, potentially. We need qubits. We need entanglement distillation. We need entangled photon sources, single photon detectors, orchestration software to make this all work, transducers. And we need very tight synchronization. Uh, I think some of the presenters will talk about that later today. Um, and I don't want to get into the details of entanglement distillation, but it's, for local area networks, it should be fairly easy. So wide area networks. So this is more, say, enabling a quantum internet type of thing. Well, now we're also going to need all those things from before, but we're also going to need potentially quantum repeaters. We're going to also, as we've heard in prior quantum marketplaces, we're going to need to operate on an, the existing telecom fiber infrastructure. Verizon has said that publicly. Uh, others have said that publicly, uh, and, that, and that's a very tough order. But you know, entanglement distillation also becomes a little bit more difficult in wide area networks. So that wide area quantum network, so that needs to be addressed as well. 
But as, as Thomas will allude later today and maybe others, there's also another factor here in that uh, he did his calculation yesterday and gave it to me, but from NIST, this all has to be done with less than a femtowatt of noise in the quantum channel to be used. That is really low. And that is a lot lower than the current data and telecom networks. Okay, so quantum networks. These are quantum, there, there are quantum networks at these facilities either already or they're being built. Uh, and these, you know, have test bed capabilities. And so, you know, some of the early work pioneering work at the universities and the federal funded you know, research facilities uh, has been great. And now what we're gonna hear today is further work from EPB and the network they're building powered by Cubitech and others in this, in this cohort today. And then also uh, NIST is, is, is doing very pioneering work as well. And both these networks I wanna highlight because they're more of a uh, sort of highly configured, highly controlled. And, you know, whereas, you know, the quantum network from EPB, what I understand is, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, architected with a certain number of players. Uh, so it's highly configured. The NIST architecture, what I understand is also not only highly configured, but it's gonna have very different aspects to it. So it's more of a heterogeneous uh, place. So I think both of those, both of those could be very powerful to the ecosystem because they can allow, and they're talking about allowing companies to come in and test their gear and help to develop standards. So that's very, very helpful. Okay, in terms of the lineup, we have Duncan Earl, the president and CTO of Cubatech. He's going to be talking about the work that they're doing with EPB and others to build that quantum network. We have Thomas from NIST, who's a physicist there who's key in, in building their quantum network test bed. Uh, we have Gabe from Keysight, who's leading business development in quantum test uh, and other areas as well at Keysight. We have Morella at Quanopticon, who's the CEO and co-founder. She's gonna be talking about their uh, very fascinating quantum computer-aided design package that can be used to uh, design uh, quantum networking, quantum networking test beds. Uh, Michael is going to is co-founder and VP of R&D at Alero. He's going to be talking about their software suite orchestration uh, and and also modeling tools and and also presenting a bit of a user perspective uh, because they need their software to work in production networks. Uh, and then Aaron is going to give a unique view from IonQ. He's a senior staff engineer there. Uh, they need to, his company was recently acquired by INQ and they need to basically scale their quantum computer, connecting their quantum processor engines together. So he's going to talk a bit about that and the needs that they have. My name is Duncan Earl. I'm the president and the chief technology officer at Cubitech. And I'm going to be talking about the EPB quantum network today. I actually am sitting in one of the equipment hubs for this quantum network. So this is, this is a, a uh, actual equipment that's behind me that's containing some of the quantum equipment we'll talk about today. So I, I know this has been presented in past uh, quantum marketplace um, presentations, um, but uh, for those that haven't seen it, this is the first commercial quantum network in the nation. It is owned and maintained by a utility and internet, internet service provider here in Chattanooga, Tennessee called EPB. It is 100% um, uh, industry funded. It, no government funding went into making this commercial quantum network, and it's really focused on supporting the needs of, of industry. And it does that by incorporating um, common use resources that many of us need uh, for our different applications in quantum. On the right side of this uh, slide, you can actually see some of the hardware components that are available to users. Um, these are, just, are installed in something we call equipment hubs that are distributed around the network, but they include things like quantum sources, heralded photon sources, entangled photon sources, uh, high efficiency detectors, superconducting nanowire detectors with measurement uh, optics in front of it that lets you do uh, tomography and other uh, types of measurements. There's electronics and software that allow you to correlate with high precision uh, events that are occurring across the network. And then there's coherency control, which allows you to uh, ensure that your qubits are coherent across the network and that they can interfere all of that hardware is provided by commercial companies, so it is commercial quantum devices that are backed up by, by vendors and, and warranties. 
Uh, EPB, if you haven't heard of them, is an incredible network uh, in Tennessee, incredible uh, utility in Tennessee that has over 600 square miles of optical fibers. They've dedica dedicated a cable consisting of over 216 uh, dedicated optical fiber strands that tie together uh, the multiple nodes on this network and give the users access to millions of dollars worth of equipment that they can configure for their applications. And that's all done through a subscriber-based uh, model. So what can you do with this, this network? The three probably most prevalent things that you can do with this network are to um, accelerate your own product development. You can uh, reconfigure the network for your specific application. So if you're doing QKD or you're doing quantum memory systems or whatever your product might be, you can use this infrastructure to, to really accelerate the development of that product. Because it's a multi-mode network, you can also collaborate with others. If you're developing a system that needs a very specific kind of source, another user on the network can provide that source and you can collaborate over the network um, to, to demonstrate or to develop uh, your technology. And then most imp importantly, you can sell your network technology to, or you can sell your technology to users of the network. So you can deploy products. And one of the, the biggest customers potentially for new commercial products developed with this network is the network itself. Again, quantum memories are a great example. That's where we could incorporate a commercial quantum memory into the source for all the users to utilize. But obviously there's lots of other uh, products that could be sold to these same uh, network users. Um, this is the start of a commercial quantum network, but we know that uh, as technology advances, as new commercial products uh, arise, we can incorporate those into this network to make it better. This is kind of a, a quick look at our, our technology roadmap. Everything that you see on the bottom there is already provided uh, by the network. That's what will be a part of the network when it's released in July of 2023. And then those resources can be used by users to develop the technology that's a row above it. Uh, quantum memories, narrow line with configurable sources, phase lock uh, sources throughout the network and network simulators. With that technology developed, we can go another rung up and then another rung up and slowly claw our way up to the top where we can integrate lots of different quantum technologies together, whether they're communication sensing or computing technologies. Ultimately, this network needs to serve uh, all of those different types of applications. Uh, real quick look on the right are some of the companies currently involved in the, the network, but we invite many to come and join us. Most importantly, last slide here, I really hope others will come and, and see this technology. Uh, we have a tour and demonstration planned at the QEDC plenary session, which is March 23rd and 24th. Before and after that meeting, if you want us to get more of a, a private tour and have some discussions, give us some feedback on how you'd use that network. We invite people to a roundtable uh, session. And then uh, if you want to get dive deeper into the technical details of this network, we have some uh, technical papers that you can learn more about. The links to all of that will be in the uh, chat. And you can also use these QR codes to register for the feedback sessions, register for the QEDC plenary, or look at those technical papers. And that is my overview. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm uh, Thomas Garretts, a physicist at NIST in Gettysburg. I'm leading a project on uh, quantum network and component metrology as part of our, of our quantum network uh, testbed in Gettysburg. And uh, as part of our research team, uh, we're working on, uh, you know, answering this question, what do we need to build a complex quantum network? And uh, for this, we're now setting out and have set out to set up testbed uh, on the NIST Gettysburg campus. Uh, we are developing a uh, metrology that is uh, associated with the uh, entanglement distribution in this network. And also um, we're working and, and hoping uh, to be able um, uh, to provide input to the future development of standards for heterogeneous operation of components within the network and the network itself. So we're developing the tools uh, to enable quantum networking uh, and enable the nascent quantum industry. And uh, we're trying to understand the operation of quantum networks and find no-goes and, uh, and, and uh, potential trade-offs um, that we can implement. So this is, uh, this is an overview of schematic of our uh, network, uh, quantum network testbed at the NIST Gatorsburg campus. We currently have five labs connected uh, with a line of sight of about 250 meters. Um, from, uh, from one lab, we have a direct connection to a, um, a hub um, that uh, then connects to a 60 kilometer fiber out to the University of Maryland and the DCQ net. Um, and so this is a great infrastructure um, to do actual in-field and uh, out-of-the-field quantum networking and uh, experiments. 
um, sort of key enablers um, for quantum metrology are single photon sources, um, entangled single photon sources and receivers, and of course, metrology me methods and the protocols. And so we have been developing these uh, over the last um, uh, couple of years or so to make them portable, to make them um, deployable in, in, in the quantum network and uh, move them around nodes, move them, move them around buildings uh, and potentially different in institutes. And here, this is a photograph of, uh, of some of the sources and receivers that we've built. So by this, by having the sources and detectors, we're now um, starting to perform measurements. And so we envision in the future to have these measurement nodes, these uh, components somewhere strategically located out inside the quantum network that can then serve as the state, uh, as, as generating uh, entangled state of light and then also characterize the state. So that can be useful for verification and quality control of these uh, quantum links between components and different nodes. And of course, they should also be there to uh, verify timing synchronization between the individual nodes, which is a, a, a very tough requirement. Uh, and it's on the order of five orders of magnitude uh, more stringent than what is needed classically or what is being standard classically now in the classical networking. Um, in terms of uh, uh, standards, we have been working over the last uh, one and a half years or so in a, a dictionary um, that pertains to single photon sources and detectors. Um, these are defining metrics. And the reason for this is to promote a common language and clarity in communication so that when we talk about a metric, we know that we talk about the same metric. Um, so this dictionary will hopefully provide clarity on data sheets between different vendors, and it can serve as a basis for standard development. And what we're actually planning on doing when this um, dictionary is done to submit it to a standard development organization. Um, and so with that, um, some of these definitions might become a standard. Um, so now um, we have some tools um, and the test bed. Let's do some metrology. So these are some measurements that we have done on the test bed so far. Um, a, a few selection of those, and the most important one, I think, if you you know connect two nodes, is a fiber loss characterization. And we have developed a single photon-based OTDR optical time domain reflectometer that can measure fiber loss, um, and it's actually wavelength tunable. We can we can uh, spend a complete telecom band from the O band all the way to the U band, and measure fiber loss and measure where the fiber loss occurs. So that is a very important tool and a very good tool to have. Uh, on the long fiber link out to the University of Maryland, that's a 60 kilometer link, we have measured the polarization stability and um, we have found diurnal variations and the variations uh, uh, the, the, the speed of variations will change um, compared to night and day. Uh, it, it really helps these measurements and these kind of measurements really help to determine the bandwidth on, on which fiber polarization has to be stabilized in these fibers. Um, we have also looked into quantum node synchronization uh, using some uh, high accuracy protocols. We're able to um, synchronize on the NIST campus nodes down to five picosecond peak to peak precision and on a metropolitan scale down to 200 picoseconds. So with this, these are really useful tools, measurement tools to characterize your link, to characterize the synchronization. And now we wanna of course in, uh, distribute entanglement and perform swapping experiments, teleportation eventually. And so these tools can be used to first characterize the link, but then we also need the sources. And this is a an example of a source that was distributed over 140 kilometers um, with entanglement, polarization entanglement, and it's um, um, it's very promising um, to be able to use that in the future um, for our metropolitan links. And um, so last but not least, we also looked into quantum classical coexistence uh, that comes down to the noise problem that uh, Mark alluded to earlier we're able to characterize the loss in fidelity or reduction of fidelity uh, for this polarization in single state when we also coexist the classical uh, signal in the same fiber as the quantum signal. And so with this, um, I would like to conclude, uh, put up my contact information here and um, please reach out to me if you have any questions um, and thank you for your attention. 
Hi everyone, my name is Gabe Lonetsky. I'm a business development lead here at Keysight Technologies. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what solutions we have for quantum networking. So a high overview of Keysight, we have a pretty broad portfolio of solutions for quantum research. From our test and measurement solutions, we have you know, a lot of oscilloscopes, network analyzers, arbitrary waveforms, uh, and a photonic and optical types of instruments for research as well as uh, quantum control systems. And we have a lot of different software platforms from Labber, which I'll be talking about, uh, Pathwave, uh, Pathwave and, and our quantum benchmark software. So overall, we're looking at the entire uh, quantum ecosystem from early device development, such as designing qubits or, or, or things on chips that uh, require advanced design and simulation tools, uh, through uh, early R&D design, through cryogenic calibration and component testing, to quantum control systems and scaling the systems for actual, um, you know, uh, large-scale quantum computing. Um, but so for the purpose of quantum networks, we, we have three main focus areas. The first being classical network testing. We probably have one of the most comprehensive portfolios for classical test solutions. Um, so we, we offer full network tests across all layers from the physical layer through to the application layer, including software defined network and network function uh, visualization tools. And then from the actual quantum network component testing for, you know, when there's a need for testing, uh, say, uh, QKD networks, we have uh, a test and measurement photonic and optical equipment that can be used there, as well as uh, individual quantum device characterization and, and so on. And then as this industry starts to uh, go towards more photonic integrated circuits, we have, uh, you know, wafer probing test systems as well. So overall, we, we're, we have, you know, a pretty broad focus area, but I'd say like we're interested in working with quantum network companies to help, you know, further uh, the standardization of a lot of the metrology that goes into quantum networking. So I'll talk a little bit about what we can help provide today. We have uh, our Labra control software, which is uh, made up of three different servers. The first is this instrument server, which is a hardware driver instrumentation server where you can you know, write your own drivers for Keysight or non-Keysight hardware uh, to start controlling it using a Python API. And then you can begin actually controlling that instruments and, and running tests. So you can, you can create your own uh, measurements and run your own test sequences using the me uh, measurement editor. And then uh, as you get more data, you can, uh, this gets stored in this data analysis server called the log browser. And you can, you know, look at that data for fast analysis, or you can share that amongst your colleagues, things like that. So this is a, this is a way to help, um, help users, help, you know, universities and national labs get uh, measurements quickly and, and start an analyzing them. And so I'll talk a little bit about what off the shelf hardware we can provide today. So on the right here, you're actually seeing a demo of the Labber software using the hardware that you're seeing on the left. So uh, what you're seeing on left is a, a single photon uh, setup where we're using a, a single, uh, we're, we're generating single photons using a, an optical laser source that is highly attenuated through an optical attenuator. And then those uh, single photons are then sent through a polarization controller to create you know, discrete variable. Uh, photons that then are sent downstream to say uh, a, 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 a polarizing beam splitter. And those can either be you know, measured using a power meter or those can, in this case, we're actually uh, using ID Quantique single photon detectors to, uh, to measure those single photons and actually generate keys. So what's happening on the, uh, going back to the software window, you can actually see that we're, we're able to configure the log browser and measure things like quantum bit error rate or just the overall errors in our system. So what we've done and what we've in our lab is actually sh uh, is providing a way to quickly set up a you know a system like this to to calibrate it as well because we know that optical fiber does require some calibration. So um uh, I, I've referenced some papers here up top to different uh, academia academic researcher research going on in QKD using some Keysight test measurement equipment. 
I've referenced my email here below. I'll be at uh, APS March next week. So I'd love to meet anyone who's interested in, in talk, talking about quantum networks. And if you have any uh, additional questions or, or interest, you can go to our website at uh, keystate.com slash find slash quantum. So yeah, thank you. So hello everyone. My name is Dr. Marella Koliva. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Quantopticon. And Quantopticon builds a software solution uh, empowering technologists to simulate, design, and build efficient, scalable, fully secure quantum networks. Quantum networks naturally support quantum computing, and our software addresses this application as well. So we have built Quantillion, the world's first computer-aided design tool for or dedicated to quantum photonics. And Quantillion is actually available right now to buy. Uh, but what do I mean by a uh, dedicated quantum photonic simulation platform? Well, Quantillion is a quantum-enabled electromagnetic solver, and at the heart of it is a fundamental uh, quantum physical model which very accurately and uh, completely describes the interactions between light and matter on the nanoscale. Our patent-pending algorithm was developed over the course of 20 years, um, by our team of world-leading uh, multidisciplinary scientists. Uh, Quantillion operates at the physical layer of the design stack and is pertinent to any atom-like solid state system, uh, such as quantum dots, MB centers, uh, defects in 2D materials, uh, which can be optionally embedded in uh, photonic structures made of any material. So next, I will introduce you to four use cases where Quantillion makes a big difference. Um, ideally, single photon sources must produce a stream of uh, individual photons. However, um, the current generation of emitters that we have today are not true single photon emitters, and this creates problems like uh, compromised security and um, reduced rates of, of qubit transmission down the, the channels. Um, so transitioning to true so-called deterministic single photon sources will eliminate these problems. And with quit Quantillion allows to, to design deterministic single photon sources based on the quantum dot platform. And here I have shown uh, how Quantillion uses a figure of merit to obtain a true single photon emitter behavior. Now, highly indistinguishable or identical photons are necessary for linear optical quantum computing, uh, for example, boson sampling. Uh, due to variations in the fabrication of quantum dots, however, different quantum dots um, emit photons with different properties. Uh, in other words, the photons are not identical. And Quantillion can compensate for these inevitable fabrication faults uh, and ensure that the emitted photons are indistinguishable. Quantillion can also assist with the generation of uh, multi-photon states, uh, also known as cluster states. On-demand generation of N entangled photons can be used to combat attenuation of the signal in the quantum communication channel, for example, due to um, depolarization in the fiber. So this means that your signal can travel further and hence require fewer repeater stations to relay the signal over long distances. Multi-photon states are furthermore required in entanglement swapping and quantum states teleportation more generally. They also find applications as resource states in optical quantum computing and can be utilized as a secure timing signal for synchronization of atomic clocks located on satellites orbiting around the Earth. Quantillion contains a simulation toolbox that can assist with the designs of, uh, design of various uh, quantum photonic integrated circuits or qubits. For instance, we can model um, hybrid architectures of deterministic single photon sources integrated into silicon waveguides or photonic cavities on chip. And another example is optimizing the um, coupler or grating geometry to a particular uh, um, single photon emitter. And we can do this while simultaneously minimizing the insertion losses. We are currently contracted by the European Space Agency to develop extremely high quality single photon sources for Europe's first quantum encryption satellite. And we are collaborating with two top universities on this high profile project. Um, we are looking for investors um, as well as new partners and customers um, seeking to design and optimize their 
systems, particularly those who are looking to, who are orienting themselves towards uh, large scale commercial deployment of quantum networks. And finally, as a reminder, Quantilian is available to purchase now, and you can start using it today if you want. Uh, for, for a demo or to place an order, uh, you can scan this QR code. So in conclusion, if I talk to, if what I talked about uh, intrigues you and resonates with you, please reach out to us on this email address here. Um, thank you so much for listening to my presentation, and we look forward to hearing from you. So I'm uh, Michael Kuvido. I'm the co-founder and VP of Research and Development at Aliro Quantum. And today I'll be talking about uh, our involvement in the quantum network testbed space. So I'll start with some breaking news from this morning that uh, the EPB quantum network powered by Cubitech has selected AlirO.net to provide the quantum network control and orchestration. So this is very exciting news and it's been awesome working with EPB and Cubitech on this project. And uh, yeah, looking forward to some, some awesome demos for the plenary. I'd like to give a little snapshot of the uh, other amazing uh, quantum network test bed initiatives in the US and in Canada. Um, as you can see here, uh, some test beds that already exist and are up and running and others that have been announced or are currently being built. Uh, of course, this isn't comprehensive. There's uh, heavy university involvement in the space as well. And I'd like to highlight also the uh, heavy US agency involvement uh, as well. A lot of the DO DOE National Labs and uh, NIST, of course, as you heard from Thomas and, and other agencies as well, really getting involved in the space. So it's a very exciting time for the field. So how Alira fits into the, uh, the ecosystem here. So we've um, designed a solution called AliroNet that uh, allows us to work with a lot of these organizations, regardless of where they are on their quantum networking journey. So we've uh, modeled our solution in the AliroNet to support what we call the three stages of quantum network development from stage one of quantum network testbed design and emulation to actually implementing these test beds, small scale pilots um, and trial networks consisting of maybe a handful of nodes across the campus or metro scale, then ultimately you know, scaling up from there to a, a full scale deployment. So kind of double clicking on AliroNet, I'll talk about some of the uh, underpinning software products that are provided um, so first, we'll start with the Alero simulator. This is a full stack quantum network simulation tool um, that goes all the way down to the nitty gritty physics simulations for individual components uh, that you typically see in these kinds of networks, but also modeling of the, the, the fiber um, and, and other channels. A simulation of the high resolution timing, um, you know, down to arbitra arbitrary precision, which is very important, um, but also not just the, the physical layer simulation, also simulating protocols and applications. Uh, so we can make design choices on, you know, what pieces of hardware we, we would want to build into this network and how uh, that network can be used for certain applications. Next up, we have the orchestrator. So this is the touch point for the network. So this is where end users will actually uh, configure the network, schedule experiments, um, and, you know, define any performance metrics they may need for their application. And they can, uh, they can schedule their experiment. Um, additionally, it also has an operator interface, so this is important for the network owners for doing things like network management, network monitoring, uh, managing access to different resources on the network, things like that. And when it's time for an application to actually run on the network, um, that's when these uh, you know, runtime software components come into play. So we have the Alero controller, which manages uh, instances of what we call Aleros, which is our operating system. Um, that does control protocols for entanglement generation, entanglement distribution, and other control protocols necessary for uh, this quantum network test bed. So um, as we work up with many of these organizations building their test beds, of course, uh, many of them are at different stages in their journey. Some are just getting started. Some are still planning out exactly what they want to build. But these considerations tend to pop up uh, front of mind. So I, I, I thought I'd give a little bit of a user perspective for these test beds. So um, the first box is who. So who are the intended users of this network? Um, what are their common needs and use cases? Uh, is this an open network? Is this a closed system that's going to be used internally? Um, who's going to manage and maintain the network? Who are the appropriate partners and collaborators and stakeholders for this network? Then we have the what's. So what are the objectives of this uh, quantum network testbed? Is this to be offered as a service? Is this commercial? Is this for research. Um, so what, what are the objectives of this project? Um, 
And based on that, what performance metrics do we need to meet? What distances do we want to support? Um, and in turn, what hardware do we need to, to enable all of those things? Additionally, are there any other imposed constraints like budgetary constraints, timeline constraints, things like that? And finally, how? So uh, how are users going to actually access this network? Uh, how am I going to manage access to, uh, to this, this hardware and time on the network, things like that? How is this going to integrate with the rest of my classical systems? Um, and how is this network going to mature over time? What's the roadmap? So these are some of the common considerations that, um, that we have in discussions with a lot of these organizations building out these test beds. So I figured it would be important to highlight those. And I'd like to end with a, uh, an analog to the classical internet. And so we're seeing similar trends here in the development of the quantum internet, which is very exciting. Um, forgive me for the low resolution. I, this is probably a fax from, from the 70s. So, but we see a similar trajectory uh, with, with ARPANET, uh, with the quantum internet. But I'd, I'd like to really hammer home the point that test beds, test beds, test beds are extremely important towards this end goal we all have and we all share for the quantum internet. So from the hardware perspective, test beds are awesome for developing new pieces of hardware um, and better hardware for testing device interoperability from different vendors. Um, and then from the software perspective, testing out software integrations, developing new protocols and optimization techniques for these networks and for testing new applications that we maybe haven't thought of yet. Um, and of course, all the great benefits we get from building out these test beds, um, standards development, workforce development, and providing a path to scale as we begin to interconnect these networks. So that's it. Um, I'd like to end with a uh, comment that AlirNet was built to um, you know, design these quantum network test beds to build them and ultimately to scale them and deploy them. So regardless of where you are at on your quantum networking journey, um, we're eager to work with you and please reach out. Thanks. My name is uh, Aaron. I'm a senior staff engineer at um, INQ. And uh, what I work on at INQ is on building uh, computers that can scale. So really trying to increase the scale of our quantum computers. Um, but I'll start by talking about INQ in general. So INQ um, is a full stack quantum computing company and we build our quantum computers out of uh, single ions. So the qubits are single ions and ions are incredibly good qubits because we can stack them in a chain and we can control them incredibly well. And uh, just as an example of how well we can control them, the most powerful quantum computer that exists today is our AQ25 uh, system, which basically means we have not only 25 qubits in our system, but those 25 qubits operate at, at the high level that's required uh, for a 25 qubit quantum computation. Now, the idea is to keep on increasing it, keep on increasing our computational power, not just by increasing the number of qubits, but by keeping the quality of this, these, those qubits high, and in fact, increasing the quality of the qubits because you need better qubits as your systems become more complicated. Now, the only way to continue doing that, uh, and it's independent of which system you're on, is to take lots of small quantum computers and connect them together into a large network. Um, and uh, this kind of idea was pioneered um, by, among other people, our two founders, um, Chris and Jung Sang. And so this is really something that's in the DNA of, of IMQ from the very beginning. Um, and so uh, how do you scale up with ions or how do you start going multi-core with ions? There are two general methods you can do that. The first method uh, is uh, what we call um, the reconfigurable modular quantum architecture, which basically means we take these chains of ions and we move them around. So we take two chains and we can merge them together and then we can split them. And so we keep the chains relatively small so we can have good control, um, but allow the chains to interact. And that, uh, that's a great solution. But the one I really want to talk about now is uh, the um, solution of using uh, photonic interconnects. And what's really nice about photonic interconnects is um, that once you get uh, information into a fiber, it's really easy to route it around. And so you can have very, very high connectivity between the qubits. So one advantage of uh, uh, qubits on a single chain is that they can all talk to each other very easily. 
It is one of the big advantages of IOMS. But once you go into multi-chain, um, you lose that connectivity. And so to get that connectivity back again, you want to go into uh, a, a fiber uh, network. Um, and, and again, this is where ions um, are really, really good because ions emit visible light and visible light is very easy to get into a fiber or relatively easy to get into a fiber um, and route through a you know, fairly standard optical network. So we, we kind of have the tools uh, to do that. Um, so what do we need in order to get uh, a complete network going? Um, we need low latency interconnects to collect light from the ions and uh, basically entangle the, the quantum computers with each other. We need uh, protocols to manage how the information flows in the system. And those protocols are very, very different from the protocols you would have on an internet kind of network, because now you need things to work extremely fast and you need the entire machine to work as one computer. Um, and we also need uh, methods for multi-core compilation because at the end of the day, when we want to distribute the task, we want to kind of use the, the interconnects as, as little as possible. We don't want to move information around too much. And we know that all of these things kind of exist and, and are being sort of developed for classical computers. When you want to have a supercomputer, you need low latency interconnects, you need protocols to manage information flow, and you, you, you need methods for compilation. You know, none of these things sort of exist uh, out of the box. Even for classical computers, you have to kind of use very, very specific uh, protocols. If you tried to run uh, a supercomputer through the internet, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be you know, nearly as fast as you want it to be. You need things to be close together, you need things to work extremely fast. And so we're, we're uh, working on all of these uh, different components in order to uh, start scaling up uh, using an optical network. Thank you. Okay, so quantum information is very fragile and can be easily disturbed. How do we best address the issue of quantum noise and loss? And I'm going to start with Thomas on this because you've done the math on this, right? Not to say others haven't. <laughs> it was a napkin calculation yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So the, well, that femtowatt was based on about 10,000 photons per second in the quantum channel that you're interested in. And, you know, consider like an ITU channel um, with some 50 gigahertz or so bandwidth. And, um, you know, starting at 10,000 noise photons per second, it, it, it starts to become more difficult to, um, to distribute entanglement at high fidelities. And of course, it depends on the qubit system, you know, whether it's SPDC um, or ions and, and so on. I mean, there's some some wiggle room on that. But noise is detrimental and loss, and, and they kind of go hand in hand, right? So if you lose your, your quantum signal due to loss, but you have noise coupling into the fiber, um, your fidelity will um, just degrade. And... Um, how do we, yeah, how, how do we best address issues? I mean, that's something that we're currently researching and trying to find the, you know, parameter space and the trade-offs. Can we, um, you know, run, and that has been done in QKD times, so I did, you know, very early on during, during the discovery or the, the, the development and research of QKDs, the coexistence, you know, what kind of classical signal can you send um, through the same fiber as the, the quantum signal? Um, because what you get is you get scattered photons, for instance, through Raman scattering into the quantum channel, even if they are different wavelengths. Right. Um, if they're time multiplexed, um, you know, even, you know, the strong classical signals will, you know, bounce back and forth at, at you know, some connectors in your, in your fiber that splices and will end up in the time you would expect your quantum signal. So, what, um, yeah, well, and what about the concept of connector loss, right? So in telecom and datacom, connector loss is low, but for these types of networks, mm -hmm. it needs to be a lot lower. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question and an interesting debate because, you know, currently you can get <clears throat> connector losses that are on the order of 0.1 dB, uh, which I think mm -hmm. is on the order of 2%. And that's certainly enough for uh telecom classical applications, I would say, and I would just say that. Um, and for quantum applications, 
I feel like that is not enough and we need to do better in terms of connecting right. the fibers easily. Um, you could say, you know, I have a kilometer of fiber um, or, you know, 10 kilometers of fiber, which um, will give me more loss than one of the connectors, right? But, and that's, that's, that's true, you know, if you look at the long haul um, distribution, then it's fine. But where most of the connectors are and these losses occur is actually at the last mm -hmm. mile. Um, and we see that at NIST quite significantly. So having patch panels you know, and all the connectors and distribution, right? Yeah. And yeah. You know, yeah. think about it, you know, you have an, let's say an ion system, you want to transduce uh, to a telecom wavelength because you may have low loss, then you have a memory, right. you may also have to get transduced. There's components that need to be connected. And I guess we don't want to splice everything. We want to be able to, you know, uh, be uh, more versatile and switch things around. So we need to go through switches as well. And I think we need to correct our ice stores with low loss. So. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Duncan, I'm sure this is keeping you up at night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we have over 1,200 splices that we actually have performed on the, the network at EPB. So, I mean, uh, reducing loss is critical. I, I think what you're going to see in the early stages with these quantum networks is that really the preference is more towards flexibility and configurability with a little higher, well, a lot higher loss for that flexibility. But as we start to converge on kind of standardized solutions, we can remove a lot of the loss that's being introduced really to give us that, that flexibility as we know more about uh, the, the final uh, configuration. So loss, I expect, will be uh, heavy uh, in the early days, but will begin to shrink uh, as we can, can pull out some of that uh, flexibility or we no longer need that flexibility. In addition to, when it comes to quantum noise, I think there's one easy solution on this and that's just to build smaller networks. You know, start off with small networks. Everybody wants to go really far, hundreds of kilometers, but initially we can learn a tremendous amount from very small, you know, metro scale type networks. And that's probably a, a suitable solution for the near term as we try and understand more about the different components and how to pr improve the overall network performance yep yep great um gabe how are you how is keysight helping people test this yeah um i guess there's a there's a it depends on the approach um you know one one um area that we can tend to help with is like i said testing the classical layer and i think that goes into Kind of twofold like first of all you're you're if you're generating quantum information over a classical network how does that quantum information you know how does that interact with what is happening on that network say when you start generating more traffic on the network or you know more users on the network so like what we can likely provide help with is actually doing those types of simulations or doing those types of metrology tests that uh, Tom Thomas is doing a lot of today. So I, you know, I'm impressed by all the work that Tom is doing and his team over there. It's it's quite it's quite amazing at the how much uh, information he's he's gathered over over the time that he's been doing this. And um, like I said, like we we're, we would be very interested as you know Keysight, we'd be very interested in in working more closely with like NIST or Duncan to actually understand what what is it the, what are the types of challenges that are going uh, that that you're seeing and how can we actually provide uh, what what can Keysight do to provide better measurement tools to help you characterize those uh, characteristics? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, you know? fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mary, Marella, you want to comment on this? I have another question to re directly at you here coming up, but your software, um, you had explained to me that it, it helps characterize when building components and say next generation quantum picks and that sort of thing, uh, that you can minimize coupling losses, which still plagues datacom and telecom. So can you talk about that a bit? Sure. I mean, for a more technical answer, I'd probably defer to our chief scientific officer. Um, Gabby, would you like to take this one? Uh, I'm sorry, I was uh, responding to another question. Can you can you repeat that, please? Yeah, no, no, no problem. So how does your software, you know, work on these issues of let's just focus on loss for a minute, because, you know, one of the big yeah. problems with PICS 
is coupling losses, even in telecom and datacom. So in quantum, it's even orders of magnitude harder. How does your CAD software, quantum CAD software help with that? Yes, actually we are uh, able to model single photon generation and insertion loss in waveguides, for example, in um, right. integrated cir circuits on a, on a chip. We can also take mm -hmm. into account the losses in the waveguides, the propagation loss losses, and also end-to-end uh, -end, uh, efficiency uh, in, a, in a circuit, basically. I see, I see. Great, great. Well, we'll come back to that too. Uh, Aaron, how is loss an issue for you in quantum noise and coupling your photonic processors yeah. to, well, excuse me, or ion-based quantum computing processors together? Yeah, so, um, you know, there is uh, there are two problems <laughs> uh, with with quantum. Uh, one is one is noise. Uh, the other one is that there's no cloning theorem. It basically means we can't copy the information. So in a, in a standard network, what you do to combat noise is you can repeat until you succeed. <laughs> you can't do that yeah. uh, on, on a quantum network. And now you've got the information of your computation. You need to transfer it to the next quantum computer, to the next core. Um, yeah. and you need it to be intact. There is a, a workaround, and the way we do that is we distribute entanglement instead of distributing the information. And so uh, we, we do that in a way uh, that is heralded, which basically means we, we usually fail when, when we try to do that, um, but when it succeeds, we know it has succeeded. And so uh, we just repeat many, many times until success. Um, and that allows us, um, to distribute to to basically uh, have a safe way for information traveling, but of course uh, it costs time. If, if we need to try yeah. uh, a thousand or a million times, then then that's that's going to be uh, very expensive in time. And um, although uh, you know ions uh, are incredibly well developed for uh, photonic interconnect, um, it is still very hard to get the photon from the ion. Um, you know, an individual photon that is uh, spontaneously emitted and it's emitted in all directions, getting it into the fiber, um, you know, it usually misses. And, and so we are dealing with, with uh, relatively low rates and, and the way to, to deal with it is through, um, you know, through clever software, uh, through protocols. Um, and then on top of that, there's always a layer, and, and this is true for all networks of entanglement distillation, where we, um, you know, as you mentioned in, the, I think, the first slide, where we take a bunch of, of qubits and we enhance the quality of the entanglement uh, between those qubits. Uh, so right. we take, you know, 10 entangled pairs and we create one that's really, right. really good and really reliable. Right. Yeah, and I, and I really appreciate your perspective because, you know, quantum networks are early. I know that, you know, EPB and Qubit Tech are blazing the trail from the commercial perspective, which is fantastic. But also quantum computers, there's many architectures that will not scale without doing this, right? So there's a lot of pull to solve these problems commercially, right? Um, Michael, um, care to comment on this? Sure thing. So I'll, I can tackle this maybe from more of the software and protocols perspective. Yeah, yeah. How are you helping everybody? Yeah. So yeah. this is this is the kind of question that um, I think could be best addressed um, by the the simulator we've built um, because it, it is expensive to, uh, you know, stand up a quantum network test bed and to run these kinds of experiments. And you can, yeah. you can still get a, a fairly long way with, uh, with simulation and, and theory here. And so that's when we think about, you know, quantum noise and loss, like these are the, <laughs> the two big hurdles to, you know, having this amazing uh, quantum network, right? So right, right. Um, from the software and protocols perspective, uh, of course, some of the things that uh, have been mentioned already, but I'd like to emphasize. So we spoke about multiplexing. Uh, we spoke about entanglement distillation. Um, there was a question that was just asked, asked about error correction, error mitigation. So yeah. we're thinking about um, you know, how to tackle these things um, from a protocol perspective. But in order to do that, like you, you can't just look at it from, uh, from the theory and from just the protocols. Like, we're going to need to simulate all the individual components. Like, let's do a realistic emulation of what this would actually look like in the in the network. What is the uh, attenuation parameter of our of our fiber? What's the um, 
you know, like if we're using an SBDC source, like, you know, there, we really have to model these components and these channels accurately. And then we can start thinking about, okay, how is this individual protocol, this error mitigation protocol going to work? How is this, if we had this kind of source that's on demand, or we had this kind of memory that has this many channels and we can generate these entanglements simultaneously, then we can look at distillation, right? So before, before we have that hardware, like in real life deployed in the network, we can still, you know, try and develop these protocols and standards for mitigating noise and loss, um, you know, in simulation. So that that's like a typical use case of how, you know, we internally use our simulator as well to think about uh, these kinds of and your, and your simulator is comprehensive in modeling these effects. Yeah, so we have like uh, custom, we have, we have libraries built for like common components you'll see in, in quantum networks. Yeah. Um, and we have like, you know, uh, kind of sandbox models and parameters that are, you know, taken from literature and other, you know, product spec sheets, things like that for typical vendors for these components, um, but also they're, they're customizable. So if you're working on an individual, um, you know, entangled photon pair source and you have, uh, you know, some parameters you want to test out, but it, you can't just look at that component in isolation, right? You have to see how it's going to perform with all the surrounding components on it, how it's going to interact with the fiber channel, of course, all the, the coupling parameters you mentioned, then the, the parameters of the channel itself, um, and then simulating like, you know, polarization drift if you're doing polarization encoding or there's other encodings you're investigating, right? So it, it's you can't just consider that component in isolation or the protocols in isolation. You have to have this kind of uh, full, stack view. Yeah. View. full stack system view. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I think this is a very pertinent question. Uh, you know, so how are, how is everyone here designing quantum network systems and components today? How much of it is classical techniques and, you know, uh, and, Apologies, Michael should have added yours here too, but software simulation of the network, but also is anyone using quantum computer aided design software? So uh, I wanna go straight with Duncan on this. You know, how are you designing this EPV network? How are it with the partners? How are you going about that? Yes, so we're probably a little different from most in that we have the requirement that everything that's on this network, the, the core equipment that runs the network, needs to be commercially available so that there are warranties in place and there's there's services in place to keep the uh, system running so that for us that has been one of the the design constraints that we've imposed uh, in order to, to provide the services that we want but what we see is really a forum of users and other developers as we move through the coming years uh, working together to find out okay wh what's the next item that will be commercialized that we can add to this network how do we adopt the or adapt the architecture to to accommodate uh, these components. So I know that's a little different. Some of the other uh, more r and <laughs> um, test beds are, are probably looking at a different way to design and develop their networks, but we're guided really more by the commercialization of the components. Okay, great. Um, Thomas, how are you building your network? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, there are, there are certain design softwares we use for for developing our soft, uh, our sources and um you know we're also basing it off uh of of um publications uh, and so on to uh, you know to be able to predict how well the sources work in particular you know for us in particular in, in, in certain itu uh channels um the um you know most of the design and the planning of the network I think is really the uh, the control so how we uh, how we switch from uh, from from node to node um and I would th say that is that is mostly you know governed um by the by the management uh by the management plane and it's it's taken from a lot from uh, from the classical networking folks um I see I see okay great um Michael, how do you how do you do this with your simulation software and your orchestration? Sure. So, you know, when we work, typically work with an organization that's just getting started in quantum networking, they're potentially interested in building a test bed, um, but they may not be ready to commit, uh, you know, the, the money needed to, to actually build the uh, the hardware infrastructure and acquire the fiber every, everything. So we help them yeah. in, in, you know, coming up with essentially a, a few blueprints of what this could look like. Of course, there's you know, all, all the previous things I mentioned in my talk, like all those considerations, what are your goals with this test bed? Who are the users? What use cases do you have in mind? What distances do you want to support? What metrics do we need to meet? 
what other constraints, uh, you know, usually there's a budget constraint or a timeline constraint. Um, so taking all that into account and coming up with some blueprints that are, are reasonable, uh, you know, under those constraints and, and what they, they want to meet for their goals. So, um, you know, it's usually, you know, the simulation is one important part to actually come up with, uh, with concrete designs based on real, um, you know, vendor models. Yeah. But also, you know, it's a very um, collaborative kind of discussion that, that we have with these organizations, because this is a process that it's not just about the science and the hardware, then there's also like the, the uh, economic um, constraints that, that come into play here when you're building a test bed. Right. Um, and Gabe. So, yeah, from from our perspective, um, I talked a lot about like off the shelf hardware that um, could be leveraged into uh, really QKD systems um, from, say, a lot of the attenuators for generating single photons. We don't have any entanglement sources, but that's something that, you know, if there is interest, like taking that off the shelf and implementing that into like the setup I showed. Um, but then also for the polarization control too. So I guess, you know, my, from our perspective, there's, there's a lot that we can help support, but we don't have all the, all the answers. So we'd have to, you know, combine our solutions with others to make sure that, you know, that what you're trying to build or what you're trying to design is actually doing the types of things that are required for quantum networking. But, you know, all our, all our techniques are, are classical really. Um, okay. Yeah. But you're looking to partner and, and do more quantum related, right? Yeah. So we, I mean, we have, you know, a, a lot of our focus right now is driven on the metrology side for, for this industry. Okay. Um, but if, if there's, if, if there's ideas for us to implement what we can, you know, what I've shown or what I've talked about today into say testing these networks, I'd say like, we're open to looking at how that partnership can, you know, evolve into something uh, like that. Yeah. Um, okay, great, yeah. great. Aaron, so how are you yeah. designing your links now? Are you doing that classically or are you doing something else? How are you doing that? Yeah, so um, I mean, there are, you know, very, very complex questions uh, that, that go into that. Um, for, for us, the guiding principle at the end of the day is what is a technology that brings customers the best quantum computer out there? And right. that means running the most complex algorithms uh, with with our devices, and so you know the the, the in, from a from a networking perspective, the the current question is when do we switch to you know a different type of networking architecture? Um, when does that make sense in terms of the components that we can build on the one hand, and the output of of the computer? Now it becomes a a really hard problem because uh, you know, the quest is to build a computer that cannot be simulated classically. And so we have to predict performance on a machine that we cannot simulate essentially by definition. Um, and so on top of having to, uh, to understand, you know, where the trade-offs are, we want to know, you know, does this produce the kind of result that our customers would be interested in? without being able to produce it, because by definition, that is an impossible task. Uh, right. So we're designing right. a lot of tools to, to kind of figure, figure that out in, in, in other ways, yes. Okay, great. Marilla, you want Gabi to answer this or you want to answer this? Uh, this, this particular question that's on the yes. slide at the moment. Yep. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, emphasize that we're not actually building um, hardware components ourselves. Uh, in the European Space Agency project that we're involved, we're um, collaborating and we're orchestrating an effort with uh, the uh, universities of Oxford and, and Technical University of Munich to uh, manufacture the components uh, for, for this particular project. But we, we are a completely just a software firm, a software house. Um, so. Uh, in terms of designing our systems, basically, um, uh, as I mentioned during my talk, um, our software is based on a, a very comprehensive uh, theoretical framework uh, that describes um, light, light matter interactions on the na nanoscale. So we take into account all the quantum properties of light, as well as the, all the quantum properties of, of matter 
and uh, it's a very uh, it's a comprehensive physical model and we uh, it's a dynamical model as well so we calculate what happens to um, to light as it propagates through a structure um, and how how it evolves over time and uh, we we take into account absorptions reflections uh, and any interactions with the outside environment as well so uh, it, it it represents a true uh, a, it's a true representation of reality essentially um, so if you can represent something very accurately and very uh, very fully then you can make predictions about you know what ha what happens if you change uh, certain parameters like if you if you change the dimension of the device the size of the device uh, if you um, switch the type of light pulses that you're uh, feeding into it to uh, to drive it um, and uh, we we perform a parameter suite we search the parameter space to identify the parameters that correspond to optimal behavior and we use a, a figure of merit uh, to do that and we use different figures of merit in fact uh, for different properties that we want to optimize for so for example if we are designing a, a, a single photon source we want um, a near unity purity so we'll be looking at the second order correlation function uh, we, we calculate that from the emission um, uh, from the emission spectrum of the um, of, of the device or so the single photon source that we're modeling um, uh, so once we extract the second order correlation function, we op optimize the dip in the origin, which I showed uh, in my presentation. And when that dip is minimized, uh, when it reaches zero, that means that it is uh, it is behaving as a true single photon source. Yeah, great. Sounds like uh, many uh, presenters today could use your software. I'm just saying that. All right. Um, so I want to start with Aaron here. Um, you and I had chatted about this a bit. So network orchestration differs from the internet inside a, and inside a high performance computing. You know, what I mean by that is an internet, you know, has to work or the internet has to work and, you know, it has trace routes, pings. Uh, it's all about getting the message across. It's not so much about how fast did it get there. Um, and in inside high performance computing, um, you know, what I understand is, you know, even though they may use ethernet, or they use ultimately, you know, modified protocols because they need really, really high speed. So the question is, how will quantum network orchestration differ from the enabled quantum network and inside quantum computers, right? So, uh, Aaron, you want to go first, or Michael, you want to yeah. go first? Yeah, I can, I can start. So, um, okay. yeah, um, you know, the the network. Uh, is is incredibly different when you're talking about a a quantum computer. Um, the the first step is the same, right? You want to distribute entanglement, um, but then you want to use that entanglement very very quickly, um, and you want to use that entanglement very very efficiently. Now those things um, are maybe common, but in a quantum computer, if you don't do this in the right way, and you don't have all the machines working together. Um, you, the consequences are are bad, but you also have an advantage in that you kind of know ahead. Everyone is working together. Everyone kind of knows ahead what everyone else is expected to be doing. Whereas when I'm having uh, you know a conversation with you over the internet, you might suddenly turn off your video. I have no control over over these things. With with a quantum computer, we want to orchestrate everything. We want to make sure that everyone is working in sync. Everyone's memory is shared. With each other, everyone is is sort of accomplishing the same task, and we have to do that task incredibly, incredibly fast. Um, as as we go into error correction, the, the entire error correction schemes are really tailored to the to the um, to the fabric. So so the network fabric will determine what kind of error correction schemes we can do, and and backwards, right? Do for example, a question could be: Does a single qubit live in one processor? Or is it distributed over multiple processors? Um, or maybe we have 10 qubits per processor. Like these, these design decisions will really influence the protocols that we're using, the, the kind of computations that we can run, um, the kinds of interconnects we need. Um, so it, it is a very different sort of uh, mindset. Great, thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree with what Aaron was saying. I mean, this is a very different kind of network if we're considering a cluster of quantum processors and some kind of 
quantum data center, um, you know, we're talking about much shorter distances here, we can expect higher rates and, and better interconnects between the processors, right? But like you said, um, you know, this needs to happen very fast and the orchestration is going to look somewhat different than for what we call like a traditional entanglement distribution network where the goal is really to, to generate uh, long distance entanglements um, at as high a rate and high fidelity as you can, right? So from the orchestration perspective, I think maybe one, one good way to think about this question is, okay, what's the, what's the key resource here? What's the basic block of this network? Um, so for the communication network, this long distance network, um, right? I, I think it's fair to say the basic block is, is a bell pair, an entanglement, right? Um, yep. A bipartite state that you can extend the distance over time, et cetera, and swapping. That's our basic block. Like that's our resource we, we care to, that's the service the network is providing. Whereas in this quantum computing use case, um, one can argue maybe entanglement is the basic block, but I would argue it's, it's the qubit that we care about or a set of computational qubits. That's our basic block. That's our that's what we're transporting around to different processors. That's what we're using to uh, to to do some kind of quantum algorithm, right? So the the basic block, the basic resources is, is very different uh, for these two kinds of networks. So as Aaron mentioned, the, from the orchestration side, you know, in the quantum computing application, is you have to think about okay, how are we going to distribute these quantum wor workloads across a, a bunch of processors? Um, you know, uh, how do we do parallelization? How do we manage, um, you know, error mitigation routines and error correction routines? Um, and how do we do this all very fast? And we don't have time to to do like we don't have the time to do um, like classical communications between these processors because of the coherence time limits, right? So you have all these other constraints here in the quantum computing use case that you don't necessarily have in the communications network. I mean, there are a different set of problems and. Um, you know, when you're thinking about a long distance network, there's different um, kind of orchestration considerations to consider. So general network management, how do we share this, this key resource with the entanglement between different sites, different users um, for different applications, et cetera, um, which is very different than managing a, you know, kind of clustered data center kind of use case. Right, right. And does your software simulation package work in this area? Do you have libraries for this, or is this something your libraries could be created for? Yeah, I mean, I def we, we've definitely focused more on the communications network for now, but um, yeah, our, our libraries could, could be extended to, to support the computing use case. Of course, this is, as Aaron mentioned before, we run into this the uh, inevitable uh, scaling issue, right? If we're considering, uh, you know, dozens of processors with each with 16 ions on them that's a, a huge system to simulate globally right so there's going to be some right. there are some abstractions you can make some kind of shortcuts you can take it depends what you know what is the the metric you're interested in in simulating um but there are still some some things we can we can do with the simulation tool for this clustered quantum computing use case right right um for the other uh so thomas is this an area you play at all in this yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the, the, these two answers were already already great. And, and we are, of course, right now looking into uh, distributing in the entanglement. So that was uh, what, uh, what Michael was alluding to. And, you know, what I, what I want to add, basically, you know, for, for, the, for the entanglement distribution, you know, the photons fly at almost the speed of light. And, um, you know, distributing entanglement is okay between two, two parties. If you want to do long distance, then you need to do uh, entanglement swapping. And you know they need to time the photons like within their coherence time, and 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 you know that's uh, that's an orchestration that is that is difficult to achieve. Again, the the synchronization requirement is like you know orders of magnitude more stringent than what is classically um, uh, possible. Right. Um, is, 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 so yeah, and 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 then based you know if you want to do teleportation. Um, you do a measurement, and based on that, you do a feed forward somewhere on a different, you know, station that is, you know, 20 kilometers away, and there's latency there. But you want to keep that yeah. latency. I mean, there's time of flight latency, right? And you want to keep that latency as short as possible um, because you can only store your local photon for for you know what whatever given amount of time. Um, and so, right. Right. yeah, I mean, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Morella, do you have anything to add to this? Does your software help Aaron out? Um, I think I would, uh, Gabby, are you ready to answer? 
in more depth? Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, our software has, has capabilities both for quantum communication networks and quantum communications QKD protocols, but also for um, quantum computing, optical quantum computing. We can address both because we are basically simulating a nonlinear manipulation on a chip. Uh, our target system is a solid state uh, uh, um, integrated system, basically integrated uh, single photon sources, uh, waveguides or cavities on a chip and uh, uh, up to the uh, detector. So we can describe the whole integrated circuit basically. Uh, but um, uh, most importantly, we can also uh, describe uh, coherent quantum manipulation of uh, single single uh, qubits, basically material qubits, by optical pulses, and that's uh, uh, that that allows us to implement uh, scalable uh, scalable registers, basically, and um, um, we are basically at the at the interface, we are working at the interface of uh, quantum communications and um, optical quantum computing. I see, I see, thank you. Gabe or, uh, or Duncan, anything to add to these answers? So uh, I would just add that, you know, quantum networking, when we think of it, uh, we think of it as very broad. It applies to, um, you know, quantum computing, quantum sensing and quantum communication. So its orchestration needs to serve kind of multiple masters whereas quantum computing interconnecting uh, multiple quantum processors is a, is a lot more narrow, but we, we think both of these activities can learn from each other. And so that's why uh, these events should be happening in parallel. Sometimes you hear people say, you shouldn't have quantum networks until you've got quantum computers. You know, mm -hmm. why don't we until the quantum computers are built? Well, th there's a lot of information that has to be shared between the two. And if Absolutely. we expect to, to have you know, quantum networks that can interconnect, can interconnect quantum computers, we need to start. Right, right. right. Okay, Gabe, anything to add? Yeah, nothing to add. No, these are all really great inputs. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So we're sort of out of time here. Um, I think what I'll do is just talk about some upcoming events. Uh, Doug has actually posted in the chat uh, that there is a QDC student e poster session. Uh, you know, for QDC members, they can go there and watch uh, students give their presentations. These are all. Uh, you know, students working on graduating and, uh, you know, basically scout for talent. They're looking for jobs. So people are always talking about workforce, and this is from the Workforce TAC. Uh, this is a great way to find prospective hires. Um, again, there's more you can click on the or you can, you know, track the QR code there or you can see Doug's uh, posts in the chat from the Workforce TAC. That's actually the next one is Tuesday, March 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Also, the next event we're going to have uh, for the quantum network is going to be network security post quantum. Um, that's going to be after the RSA conference in April. So that'll be on May 4th.